today on Let the Bible Speak. Today we continue our study of Matthew chapter 24 and the sign of Christ's coming. Why the things Jesus predicted did not point to the second coming in the end of time. So what was he talking about? From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with Kevin Presley. And it's so good to be with you for another Bible study together. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you'll take out the Word of God and read and study with me for a little while. Last time we began an overview of the Olivet Discourse as it's recorded in Matthew chapter 24. Much is made of this chapter by modern prophecy preachers who claim that Jesus is describing events that would come to pass in relation to the eschatology of the world or end times. While I believe Jesus later addresses the subject of the end of time, He first describes the end of the Jewish temple and the city of Jerusalem, which took place nearly 40 years after He spoke these words, the destruction of Jerusalem happening in the year A.D. 70. Not only the context, but plain statements Jesus made here show this to be the case and can help us to see through some of the false theories that many have today concerning the second coming of Christ. Last week we spent most of our time in the first 21 verses of Matthew 24, and this week we want to continue further into the chapter and see what Jesus was talking about when He answered the disciples' questions about the sign of His coming and of the end of the world. Let's go back and reread the first three verses of the chapter to set the stage. Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 1 says, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and His disciples came to show Him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as He sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to Him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world or the end of the age? Remember now that the disciples asked three questions in response to Jesus' startling prophecy that the Jewish temple they had just beheld would be demolished. They wanted to know when would the temple be destroyed, what would be the sign of Christ's coming, and wouldn't this mean the end of the age or of the world? Now, as Jesus begins the famous discourse, He answers those questions, and we'll look closely at Jesus' answers in the continuation of our study and I'll return with that in a moment. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. One of the most widely believed doctrines in the evangelical world is that before the end of time, Jesus will rapture the church out of the world and a period of tribulation will commence before Christ returns to establish His kingdom in Jerusalem and reign on earth for a millennium. Well, I don't believe the Bible teaches that theory. I believe Jesus reigns now. His kingdom is already present. But those who advocate this theory suggest that there are signs that indicate that all of those things are about to happen and that Jesus is about to return. The Olivet Discourse as recorded by Matthew in Matthew chapter 24 is always used to bolster this eschatological theory. Its proponents allege that the events that Jesus describes in the chapter will all accompany this ushering in of the end times and that Jesus is describing 
how the end of time will unfold. But was Jesus talking about the end of time? Well, his disciples had been pointing out the beautiful buildings of the temple, and Jesus replied that they would all be destroyed, not one stone left upon another. Now they imagined that if such happened, it would surely be the end of the world, and so they later asked Jesus to tell them more about this, asking Him when the things He prophesied would take place, and what would be the sign of His coming, and of the end of the age. Now Jesus answered by telling them what would not mean the end was near, and then what would signal that the destruction of the temple was at hand. Now much is unnecessarily made of this chapter by overlooking the events that took place in the first century, close to the time that Jesus made these divine predictions. In fact, later in the chapter, Jesus said that these very things would be fulfilled within that generation. It would happen during their lifetimes. Now He said first in verses 6 and 7 that there would be wars and rumors of wars with kingdom rising up against kingdom, and there would be unsettling natural occurrences such as earthquakes, famines, and so forth. And sometimes people get all excited today when they hear about various political uh, happenings and wars and earthquakes and fires and so forth, and they think that this must mean that the world is rocking and Jesus is getting ready to come again. But we pointed out last week that all of those things Jesus mentioned were all things that were documented to have occurred in the first century after Jesus spoke these words. Israel had enjoyed a measure of peace since coming under the control of the Romans leading up to the time that Jesus was born, but that was all now about to change, and there would be unrest in the empire, and these upsetting events that would take place in those early years of the church after the day of Pentecost uh, that would cause some to think that the end was near, just like it, uh, such things make people start thinking that way today. And it would make it very easy for impostors to step in and claim to be the Messiah, come to save the people in those tumultuous times. But Jesus said in verse 4, Be careful, take heed, that no man deceive you, that these events would pass. And they did not mean that the end was near. Now the earth has seen war as well as natural disasters for thousands of years and will continue to do so. And such events had nothing to do with the destruction of Jerusalem nor do they have anything to do with the end of time. They are not signs of the end of time. Now Jesus said hard, not only would there be all of this unrest and turmoil in the world around them, but Jesus said hard times would come for His disciples and the church as well. But that as well did not mean that the end was near. Jesus said that despite these things, the gospel would continue to be preached until it reached every nation. Now what does he mean by that? Well, we know according to Paul in Colossians 1 and verse 23 that by the 8060s when Paul wrote his letter to the Colossians that the gospel had indeed been preached to every creature, the Bible says. Well, that then set the stage for the events to unfold that Jesus is prophesying here, and it puts them in the first century and not in some future time that we're still waiting for. He said that after the gospel had been preached to the nations, which would take just over 30 years from the day of Pentecost, again according to Colossians 1 and verse 23, he said once that has taken place, then they were to be watching for what he calls the abomination of desolation to appear. Now again last week we learned in Luke 21 that this referred to the appearance of the pagan Roman armies which would encircle Jerusalem and very soon invade and destroy it. He specifically tells His disciples in Matthew 24 verses 16 through 20 that when they saw this occurring, that was their warning to escape Jerusalem before horrible atrocities befell it. Those in Judea were to flee to the mountains. The church was to leave Jerusalem and seek refuge in the hills. They were to get out quickly and thus pray that this didn't occur in the winter or on a Sabbath day where they would have been slowed down or hindered in making their escape. He says they would not want to remain in the city because according to verse 21 there would be unspeakable tribulation take place. It would be horrible. And anyone who remained in the city would suffer incredible horrors. Now if you go read Josephus, the Jewish historian, he describes the Roman siege of Jerusalem and his wars of the Jews and he paints a revolting picture, a shocking picture of what the Jews suffered when Titus occupied the city. There was starvation and death 
to the point when the hardened Romans broke into the city, there were already so many rotting corpses that even the callous soldiers were shocked by what they found. Uh, fires were extinguished with Jewish blood. Uh, and we could go on and on, but when it was all said and done, 1.1 million Jews at least died in the five-month siege and nearly 100,000 who survived were taken away as slaves, many of them taken back to Rome to build the Colosseum and so forth. Most significantly, though, just as Jesus said, the beloved temple was utterly destroyed. It was demolished. And with it, the Jewish nation was finished. Uh, and the Old Testament religious system, with its priesthood and sacrifices, was forever gone. And what we learn in the verses to follow show that it is nearly impossible to overstate the significance of the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and what it signified in regard to the reign of Jesus Christ and His kingdom. It, it was not merely another event in the timeline of history. It was not just simply an event that occurred in the history of the Jewish nation. It was an incredibly important and profound message from God Himself. It was an act of God's judgment. And it was a pivotal theological statement made when Jerusalem was destroyed, God doing so by the hand of the Romans. Now let's read on now. With that, with that as our basis, let's read on now beginning in verse 23. Now this is after they will have escaped from Jerusalem in AD 70. Jesus says, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. That means even the church could be misled. He says, See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, Look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. Now, once again, Jesus warns them not to be misled by false prophets and false messiahs. The destruction of the city would open the door for impostors to deceive even the Christians to look for the Christ to come and to save Israel, that there might still be hope for the nation. They would claim that the Messiah had secretly returned to restore the people, to restore the city, restore the nation. But Jesus says they were not to believe it. They were not to be lured back into the city. They were not to fall for this trap. Because he says when Jesus actually comes again, there will be nothing secret about it. He says in verse 27, For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, up until this point, Jesus has been talking about the Romans and their arrival, which was God's ultimate judgment upon the old Jewish nation. But here, Jesus uses the word for the first time, which refers to His second coming, His personal return, which will come at the end of time. Now remember, the disciples had asked at the beginning in verse 3, When would the temple be destroyed? And what will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now they were connecting all of that. They thought the temple would be destroyed when Jesus comes again at the end of time. But Jesus here says no, uh, that he will not personally appear when Jerusalem is destroyed. When he comes, it will be obvious and seen by all, just as the lightning that streaks across the sky. So they were not to be misled into thinking that there was a future for the nation of Israel by virtue of the Messiah's return. But instead, he says, that Jerusalem and the system it had for so long represented, it was now dead, and it would be completely taken out of the way once and for all. The only ones who would be saved were those who turned to Him through the preaching of the gospel before Jerusalem was destroyed. And after that, the old physical nation would be no more. Now notice, He then says in verse 28, For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Now the word eagles could also be translated vultures. Well, that's a familiar sight. The Israelites of the first century, you see, had their chance when the gospel was offered to them, first of all, but those who had rejected the Christ, well, they were not the true Israel. They were not the remnant. And they are pictured by Christ here as a corpse, a dead body, with birds of prey hovering above, referring to the Romans who were God's instruments of punishment and destruction. So the fall of Jerusalem marked the end of the old nation and confirmed the reign of Jesus over the new and true Israel of God, the church. There is no doubt that Jesus reigns, that all of the things testified to by the apostles in those 30-some years 
after the day of Pentecost were true. God vindicated all of that in the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Look in verses 29 through 31. He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Now what tribulation is he talking about? He's not talking about some tribulation toward the end of time, a seven year tri He's talking about the tribulation he's just described. The siege of the city of Jerusalem. That which would happen in that generation. He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And He shall send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now these verses in particular are what tempts so many people to believe that Jesus here is simply talking about the end of time. They say this shows beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus is not talking about the first century destruction of Jerusalem, but He must be talking about the end of time. Such things as the sun and moon going dark, the stars falling from heaven and so forth could only be describing the destruction of the material universe, and therefore the end of everything. And therefore Jesus must be predicting and giving signs about His second coming and the end of the world. But friend, it's important that we note this type of language was familiar language to the Jews of Jesus' day and had been for hundreds of years because it was used in the Old Testament by the inspired prophets. It was used even during the intertestamental period by the various writers of apocalyptic literature that was in circulation at that time. But this was familiar language used commonly and figuratively to refer to the fall of nations, the destruction of, of nations and empires and rulers. You see, it's prophetic language and not literal language. For example, look at Isaiah chapter 13. In Isaiah 13, when the prophet there described the fall of ancient Babylon, he said there in verse 10, for the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Now that's not talking about the destruction of the universe and the end of time. It's talking about the fall of Babylon uh, thousands of years ago. And later in Isaiah chapter 34, verses 4 and 5, when he foretold the judgment of God against the ancient Edomites, he said, And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved. And the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. You see, this language was not to be taken literally. It didn't refer to the destruction of the actual heavens above us. It was figurative for the fall of a nation, in that case, the Edomites of old. Ezekiel uses similar terms over in Ezekiel, the 32nd chapter. Now there the prophet is talking about uh, Pharaoh and ancient Egypt. And we know that because in verse 2 he says, Son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say unto him, Thou art like a young lion of the nations, for thou art as a whale in the seas. And thou camest forth with thy rivers, and troublest thy waters with thy feet, and foulest their rivers. So he's talking about Pharaoh. Now look at the judgment he promises will befall Pharaoh, not the universe, but Pharaoh and his government in verses 7 and 8. He says, And when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over thee, and set darkness upon thy land, saith the Lord God. So again you see these figures aren't pointing to the end of time. They're referring to the judgments of God at various times against earthly powers and nations. Well that's exactly how Jesus is using those terms in Matthew chapter 24 to refer to Jerusalem and fleshly Israel. This is Jesus' way of saying that when Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, it was God's repudiation of the old physical carnal nation of Israel and His vindication of the elect remnant that now constituted the true Israel, the new Israel, spiritual Israel. And thus in the very next sentence in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 30, He says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. 
And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Well, here again somebody says, well, that's obviously referring to the second coming of Jesus. But notice, he doesn't say the Son of Man will appear in heaven. He says the sign of the Son of Man. Because he's not talking about Christ's personal return at the end of time. He's talking about the obvious vindication of Christ and the church and God's repudiation of the old Israel and its religious system, which had rejected Jesus. And all of that was seen in the destruction of the city and the temple. He says that when that happens, it will cause the tribes of earth to mourn. Now the Greek word for earth there refers to land. In other words, he's saying the tribes of Israel throughout the land. What land? The land of Canaan. They would mourn when they saw Jerusalem destroyed and when they saw their religion gone. The phrase, the Son of Man will come in the clouds of heaven, is another Old Testament phrase that does not refer to a literal appearance, but rather is figurative language for God's judgment, such as in Isaiah 19 and verse 1, Psalm 97, verses 2 and 3. In other words, when these things took place in AD 70, the old physical nation would be judged and the Christ whom they had rejected will be vindicated and set forth to be the true king of spiritual Israel, just as had begun on the day of Pentecost and had been testified by the apostles and the miracles and signs and wonders that accompanied them since that time. Then he says in verse 31, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now angels doesn't necessarily refer to heavenly creatures, but the word simply means messengers, and in this case it refers to the apostles who were messengers of the gospel. The sounding of the trumpet is another Old Testament reference to when they would blow a trumpet to gather the people at various times for celebrations and proclamations and feasts and so forth. Jesus is saying that with the destruction of Jerusalem, the gospel would finally call all of spiritual Israel together in one nation in Christ. And we're living in that era now. It's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see, whether we be Jew or Gentile, if we are in Christ, Paul taught in Galatians the third chapter, we are the true children of Abraham and the true Israel of God. So you see, Jesus is not referring to the end of time. He's not giving signs of the end of the world. He's predicting the destruction of the ancient city of Jerusalem and the Old Testament temple and the symbolic ending of the old and confirmation of the new in Christ. So what of the end of time? Jesus uses 35 verses of this great discourse to show them that the end of Jerusalem does not mean the end of the world. He answers their question about His second coming and the end of time, beginning in verse 36, when He says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Here He gives all of these signs and indicators of the destruction of Jerusalem. But He says, Of that day, the day of His return, no man knows that day or hour not even the Son of Man. He says that the signs pointing to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, there will be no such signs pointing to His coming back. Jesus will come again one day to judge this world, destroy the wicked, and take the saved to heaven to live with Him. But He says we cannot know the time that will take place. And therefore the message is plain. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be a thousand years from now. And we should always be robed and ready for His return, for it will one day come without warning and like a thief in the night.
Subscribe to our YouTube channel to see all of our past broadcasts plus extra videos including Let the Bible Speak classics all the way back to the 1960s. And get new updates, go to YouTube and search for Let the Bible Speak TV and click on subscribe. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. Are you ready for the coming of Jesus? If you have not placed your faith in Him, repented of your sins, confessed that He is the Christ, the Son of God, and been buried with Him in baptism for the remission of your sins and added to His church, well, you're not prepared for His return, and you need to get prepared. And if we can help you in your obedience to the gospel, we would be delighted to do that, and we hope to hear from you. If you would like a free printed copy of our lesson, we'll be happy to send that to you. Simply get in touch with us and ask for the lesson, Signs of the Second Coming, and it will be on its way. Don't forget our website, ltbstv.org, our social media sites, including our YouTube channel, and we have a podcast you can subscribe to. Just look for Let the Bible Speak TV and keep up with us that way. We hope you'll make your plans to join me back here next time for another Bible study. Until then, I pray the Lord will bless you with a wonderful week ahead and that He will bless you as you study His Word and seek to do His will. We'll see you next time. Bible Speak is brought to you by your friends in the Churches of Christ.